All right, so earlier I asked you if you were comfortable in your regular seat, and I suspect that that question may have ended that comfort for today. <laughs> it might get worse. Now, um, there are a few things that you should probably know before we go any deeper into this. First, I don't choose these scriptures out of thin air. Um, I use a list of scriptures that follow a three-year cycle, and they're organized by the Christian year. And, uh, you know, they, we do this so that when Easter comes, we get an Easter scripture to talk about what's going on. And um, it provides variety. And by being on a three-year schedule, we aren't going to get the same Easter scripture every Easter. We're going to get a variety of them. So this, this three-year schedule means that, that we get variety. We get a breadth and a depth that we wouldn't get if I just chose from my favorite scriptures each week. This schedule is called the Revised Common Lectionary and it's used by many churches. And so this is the reason why if you're talking to somebody across the country or you're sitting down with a friend uh, for lunch after this and you start talking about what you heard in church, you find that perhaps we preached on the same scripture. Um, it's because of this Revised Common Lectionary. But it, so it also means, though, um, that it's got a couple of side effects. And, and so it's like uh, there are times when uh, a scripture comes up that I don't really want to preach on and that you probably don't want to hear about, right? This happens a lot, and, it, the, and the scripture makes us uncomfortable. A scripture that tells us that our wealth makes it hard to be faithful is one of those scriptures, and there are a lot of them in the Bible. But sometimes, it's because the scripture seems to be so obvious that I don't know if I can bring anything new to it, or if I can fill the entire time I'm supposed to fill for a sermon, right? This is one of those scriptures. It's very obvious to me. I'm not sure what to do with it. In this case, Jesus tells us that we shouldn't try to fake our way to the top. That the people at the party who were jockeying for position, they were trying to get to the place of honor um, at the table. Can you picture this happening? I, I can't either. I, I just don't see this happening in today's world. Um, I, I don't really have much occasion on, on my own anyway to try to jockey for position at a table. I don't eat with celebrities. I don't get to eat with Moana, right? I don't rub elbows with politicians. And so this, this seems like a foreign concept to me. But on the other hand, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it would be pretty embarrassing to be sitting in a place of honor as other guests arrive and are seated and then have to be asked to move so that someone else can sit in this seat. And by that time, all the seats are filled. And so the host then has to ask everybody to move down a spot so that you can have the next highest seat. No, they're not going to do that. They'll, they'll tell you to go clear down to the end where there's an open seat as far away from the action as possible. And like I said, not much opportunity to employ this. But I do get invited to wedding receptions on occasion, like especially when I'm doing a wedding for a couple that I don't really know other than uh, that I'm doing their wedding, I often get invited to their wedding receptions. And uh, wedding receptions are one of those places where when you sit closer to the bride and the groom, it's supposed to be more of a place of honor, and if you sit as far away from them as possible, it's, it's less. And this is especially true if the seats are assigned before you come, and there's a card on the table. Right? You kind of know your place in the pecking order. When they're not assigned, I've decided that it would be fun to experiment with where to sit. And I sort of use this scripture as a guide. Now sometimes I'll sit close to the wedding party. And sometimes I'll sit in the back of the room. And then I watch to see which tables get to go eat first. Okay, now, I never get asked to move, so that's not an indicator of whether or not this teaching works. But the, that payoff, when you, when you find out who's going to, if they're going to start at the back of the room or they're going to start at the front of the room for eating, that's kind of uh, what I'm looking for. 
for. And maybe um, God doesn't care when I eat, um, and so it doesn't really work. But this is, this is what I try to do. Um, so if this teaching were to work, then sitting in the front would mean that I would eat right after the wedding party. And um, it never works for me, ever. If I sit in the front, they start at the back. If I sit in the back, they start at the front. <laughs> So don't sit with me at a wedding reception. Okay? <laughs> now the scripture doesn't really apply to us that often. Unless you go to a lot of banquets. And of course, we could apply this, because we don't go to banquets a lot, we could apply this to other areas of life. And if we do that, then the, the understanding that our humility will serve us better than our pride is a really good lesson. If we think of ourselves as deserving of more than we do, then we'll be brought up. And if we think of ourselves as deserving less than we do, we'll be brought up. We'll be honored. And I think that's really good uh, advice from Jesus. And so, you know, we can go home now, right? Except that something happened last week and it was in this service, actually, that made me think about this scripture differently. Now remember, this thing happened, and then the next day I read the scriptures for this week, and this is the scripture that comes up. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but um, as the 8 o'clock service was getting started last week, uh, Mike Kaldenberg, uh, at the greeting time, walked like to the back of the church, and he told everybody in the back of the church that that the last four rows were the $10 seats, that you had to give $10 if you wanted to sit back there. But there are a whole bunch of free seats down front, so if you just move down front, then you could sit where it was free, right? Nobody moved. Now, it doesn't really matter what church you go to. The back rows are always the most popular, and the front rows are always vacant. Good job sitting down in front here today, right? Um, but it happens a lot. The, the back rows are often worn out, and they're indented uh, from uh, the years of the same rear end sitting in the same spot every week, right? And the front rows are usually pristine. They might be a little dusty, but like I never worry about storing stuff up here because there's always room. And it's actually the subject of many conversations among church folk. Um, if you're sitting in the back today, you're in good company across this land. That's where people like to sit, and um, and it's okay. You can you can stay sitting back there. Now, I'm not really sure why this is. I don't really understand why the back is the place we want to sit because nowhere else in our world do do people want to sit in the back, right? You go to a concert. Where's the premium seat? Right down front, right? You go to a football game. And you want to sit, like on the 50-yard line, down low. Same with the basketball game. Center court, right behind uh, the, the um, table right there, right where all the action is. And um, I, I don't even really know what that's like, because when I go to a game, I always have to sit way up high. I always sit where the t-shirt cannons won't reach. <laughs> <laughs> now, by those standards, these seats down front would be the best seats in the house. Anybody? No? Okay. Um, actually, they used to be. And my guess is, is that the reason why they aren't now is it's a reaction, whether we know about it or not, from those early days in uh, church here in America especially. Now, um, there was a time when uh, there were no seats in church. Pews were not there. It was just wide open space. The only seats would be on the very edges of... Of, of a sanctuary. Everybody stood during the service and they would try to stand down front, especially when um, you know there weren't microphones and you couldn't hear very well, down front was the place to be. But then came the Protestant Reformation. And of course Protestants can't do anything like Catholics do, at least back then they, were, they didn't want to have anything uh, similar at all. And so one of the things that came out of it is that the sermon became the longest part of the service. And people started to say, and rightly so, man, if you're going to talk that long, at least let me sit for it. 
So when churches were being built in America, you know, they had to be funded somehow. They had to be paid for when they were built. It, you know, in Europe, churches were funded by the government. It was state-run church, and so they had a ready supply of funding. But in America, churches were supported by the people who went to them. And so in order to raise money for the building, uh, people would buy the pews for the sanctuary. They'd buy their own pew. And they look nothing like this at all. If you look it up, you'll see that they were like boxes and that there were pews inside the boxes. Actually, when they were something that you could buy, um, they were a really hot commodity, and so they had to be protected somehow. Those boxes had gates on them with locks, and only the family that could sit there had the key to the lock. Prominent folk would buy the pews down front where they could be seen by everybody in the community that they were the most prominent family. They probably said it was so they could hear the pastor well, but that wasn't the reason. Now, in order to keep your prominent seat, again, those doors and those locks, and, and sometimes the pews would even have names on them. They'd be little plaques or a portrait painted on the seat. Can you believe it? No mistaking whose view that was. Their face was on it. And when they died, those pews would get handed down to the next generation. And if there wasn't another generation, then a bidding war would happen on those pews. These could be yours for free. And so the reality is, is that the back pew is, you know, the most <coughs> popular pew in many churches. That's just the reality. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Except that it's also the place where new folks want to sit. Now, they don't want to sit there because it's the best seat in the house. They don't know that. They want to sit there because they see it as the most safe. They, you know, they may not be sure about church. They may not be sure about having to meet new people. If you sit in the back, you can kind of see everything that's going on in front of you. You can watch to see when people stand and when people sit and when they pray. It, so it's a, it's a place of comfort. They may want to duck out right after church so they don't have to shake a bunch of hands of people that they know until, you know, that they don't know until they get used to the place. They may not feel like they're worthy of sitting closer being any closer to the altar. And so they would rather sit in the back. And I, and I get that. But what that means for us is that um, we have to be aware of this. And I don't mean that you can't sit in the back row, and I don't mean that you can't sit in your favorite spot. But if we're aware that, uh, of what people might be feeling when they come into the place, then we can uh, do our best to make folks feel welcome. And that might mean moving down a little bit so that someone can sit in the spot that we normally sit. Or it might be sitting next to somebody just so that they um, have a guide to feel comfortable during worship. And, uh, you know, maybe you see a whole family come in, you know they want to sit in the back because they want to uh, duck out if, if they need to take a baby out of the sanctuary for whatever reason. You know, I love hearing uh, babies cry, so it doesn't bother me, but they may feel uncomfortable with it, may mean that we have to move to, to help them uh, feel more comfortable. And again, you might try it out down here if that's uh, what happens. Now, one of the things that's going to happen today is that we're going to have communion. And so we get to see like a real readily available feast. But every church service we have is a feast. It's a place where we come to celebrate with our host, which is Jesus. Church is a feast where everyone is invited. And we know this. But guests who are coming, they're thinking about coming, they, they don't know this. They, they don't know that they're invited. I've had uh, folks ask me over the years, is it okay if I come to church? Do I need to come with somebody? Do I need an invitation? It's like, we know. It's like, yeah, you can come. The doors are open. Everybody's welcome. But folks don't always know that. They don't know if they're invited. They don't know where they can sit. They don't know if they can eat at the table. 
or participate or, or come back. And so the point today is not about where you sit, really. Because we see there's lots of open seats. And so it, we're not worried about, you know, there not being uh, seats for people. But it is about having an attitude or an awareness of what's going on around us, especially when new folks come. And I've watched you, and you all do a great job of welcoming people. You're really good at it. I want us to always be good at it. So from time to time, I might remind us to be aware of, of what is really comfortable for us. We may not notice what's not comfortable for other folks. And so this scripture reminds us that even if we aren't going to all of a sudden move down here to the front, that we need to be aware of how we welcome folks and help people become comfortable in this place. And so in this culture, that might mean, you know, the culture of church, it might mean that we would move forward a little bit to help folks feel more comfortable. And if that happens again, it's really nice down here. It really is. All right. Um, try it sometime. That's all I'll say. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Now, sometimes we get, um, we come upon a scripture and, uh, you know, what you say makes really great sense, but it doesn't quite translate to us. And so help us to find ways in our own lives in which the, the thing that you're trying to get across to the insiders, the church people, um, helps us to, to really relate. And in this case, it's um, helping folks find you, to find the host, which is you. And whatever we can do, uh, if that's uh, helping folks find a good seat, if it's sitting next to folks and helping them feel comfortable, if it's uh, moving uh, for a Sunday so that we uh, experience what it's like to not be in our comfortable place. Lord, help us to do that because our goal is to be as close to you as possible and to help others feel close to you as well. So speak to us and help us to know how that works for you in our life. In your name we pray.